Oh, I better take attendance before I get going too far here. Quadratic functions are functions that have a t as the highest power of the x. That's what makes them the quadratic. And the reason that that happens, bless you, is if we think about the fact that it would be x squared, that would mean whatever we're going to put into that function is going to be made positive. So the parent function is just simply thinking to 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9. Again, you probably accidentally memorized those back when you were in exponential because this was the basis for exponential algebra. So quadratic functions and transformations. We have basic parabola right here, which would be the parent function f of x equals x squared. And again, I don't really even think of it as memorization because it takes us all of, you know, a second to think through of each one of these. But what happens is we square it and we realize that we're going to get positives back. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be times when our parabola opens downward, but when we have the parent function, this is it. You know, that's as basic as it gets. So our parent function shows us that we are talking about parabolas. And when we're graphing a parabola, we have two different ways that we're going to see it. We're going to see the standard <coughs> form of a parabola, which means everything's already been multiplied out. And we look at it, and we see our ax squared plus bx plus c. And hopefully when you start thinking about the a, b, and c, you think back to the quadratic formula. Um, that's where those A's, B's, and C's come into play, is when we're trying to solve that standard form of a parabola. But if we want to graph it, then we have to think about it a little bit differently. And just like we learned with our absolute value graphs, we really like a nice, easy format to graph these with, and that's going to be vertex form. <coughs> and you can see we have our A, H, and K, which we've been talking about like crazy, and it works exactly the same way that it works for absolute value. It's just that our beginning shape, our parabola, is different because we're not talking about a V anymore. So our little parent function down here, again, it, we're going to memorize this even though we probably don't want to. Um, we just do our perfect squares. And that's the original that we're going to start with. So we graph that one. Again, it's not a big shocker what we're going to see here. And you could just graph the right side, and then you could use symmetry for the left side. So if you're thinking, am I supposed to memorize, you know, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3? No. You know, it, it, first of all, you wouldn't have to memorize. You could just put those in. But then you could also use symmetry to get the left side of that graph, and you wouldn't necessarily have to go through the table every time that you want to graph it. So there's our parent function, f of x equals x squared. But now we want to talk about domain and range. And domain, again, is the inputs, the x's, and range, the y's, the outputs. So I start thinking, were there any x's that I can't put into x squared? Is there any number that we have that we couldn't square? I realize, no, we could put whatever number we want in there. So the domain is going to be all real numbers. But the range, the range is about the y's. And I look at this graph and I realize none of these y's down here are ever going to get used for this graph for y equals x squared because everything that pops out of there is going to be positive. So when I'm thinking about my range, I realize, well, my y's are going to be greater than or equal to 0 because 0 is the lowest y value I will be able to graph. You know, that's it. I'm not going to go below there. But then I also start thinking in terms of our a, h, and k. I think, all right, well, when we dealt with a before, if a was negative, it flipped it down one. Well, that's definitely going to affect the range. You know, this, this stuff that's up here right now would be going down this way. And if my a value is not one, um, that could affect things, but not necessarily my domain and range because my a value is going to make this a vertical stretch. It'll go up faster if it's a number bigger than 1, and it's going to slow it down, and that fraction will actually pull this apart a little bit. So domain and range-wise, that's not going to do anything. 
And then I think about my H, and my H is that right or left shift. Not going to affect what I'm talking about for domain or range. But if I have a K value, my K shifts my graph up or down. That will affect my range because I'll be down in Ys where I normally wasn't before. Or instead of zero, if I'm up here at four, well, now I could say Y has to be greater than or equal to four. So there are different things that you think through as you remember our A, H, and K. So now, problem number one says graphing F of X equals A, X squared. And here's what I need everybody to remember. This is our new parent function for any of the graphs that we're going to do. If we see f of x equals 3x squared plus 5x plus 7, the 3x squared, that gives us our shape. That gives us our parabola and tells us that it has a vertical stretch. So this one that we see up here is f of x equals x squared, but we want to know what's going to happen to that if we put a number in front of it. And in this case, we've got a 1 half x squared. Well, we already know. It should end up being, well, compressed, kind of pushed down, opened up a little bit. But what we're going to do is take a look at the table and how all of this you know, changes dependent on what that A value is. So normally, if we just did x squared, we'd say parent function 4, 1, 0, 1, 4. But that's not what we're doing this time. We're doing a half of that. So I need my half of my 4, half of 1, half of 0. And then it just repeats again because of the symmetry. So when we graph, we only use the x's and then the values that we got when we took 1 half times those y values. So negative 2, 2, negative 1, 1, 0, 0. And then you can just use symmetry, whether or not you want to do the right-hand side first and then the left-hand side or go back the other way. Oops, that should be 1 half. And you can always put more numbers in there because you can think to yourself, hey, if I had 9 in there, um, my y value is half a 9 is 4.5. So negative 3, 4.5, and positive 3.4.5. But this is more open. It's, it's wider. Uh, some books, instead of talking about Expressions will say it widens the graph. And that's this factor of one half. It's kind of slowing it down. It's not going up as quickly as it was before. So our transformation here is all about that one half, and that's going to be a compression. And it's a compression factor of one half. We didn't have any H's or K's, no shifting right or left, up or down. So I go over to the domain. And I think, well, is there restrictions on this for what I put in for x? I mean, is there any number that I can't follow the order of operations for and get an answer in 1 half x squared? And the answer is no again, because we can square whatever number we want, and the order of operations says that's what I'd have to do first, and then multiply it by 1 half. And there aren't any numbers that you can't multiply by 1 half. So the domain is all reals. Also realize, okay, if I'm squaring them first, I'm back to positive. Well, I'm going to multiply times positive one half, so they're still all going to be positive. So my range is still y is greater than or equal to zero. None of that has changed because of that one half. We thought it was just a vertical compression. That's all it was. So now down here, we have graph f of x equals three x squared, and again. We can just plop our normal ones down there and then say to ourselves, well, all I have to do is multiply that by 3, whatever I have. So this would now be a 12, a 3, a 0, a 3, and a 12. This is going to go up faster, and it should, because that 3 in front, that's a vertical stretch. So again, we're not graphing that parent function in the middle. We've come up with our new parent function here, and negative 212 is obviously going to be off our 
rid a little bit there. But uh, negative 1, 3, 0, 0. And then if we use a little symmetry, we've got it. Same thing that was happening with absolute value. If the number in front is bigger than 1, and I'm not talking positive or negative, just the numerical value. If it's bigger than 1, it's a vertical stretch. If it's a fraction between 0 and 1, it's going to be a vertical compression. So, question for you. Can you think of any numbers that we could not use for x? So our domain is still all reals. Is our lowest point any different than it was for the other graphs? So we're still talking y is greater than or equal to 0. But this one, we've got a blank here for transformation. What was the transformation of this one again? Vertical stretch, factor of. Factor of 3. So positive values in front, our parabolas are going to open up. They are. And then we just need to tell by the numerical value, is it going to be a vertical stretch or is it going to be a vertical compression? Right now, we're using tables for a lot of this, but the hope is that, you know, at some point, you kind of picture it in your mind what the graph is going to be, and then we can start translating things all over the place. So, this one says problem 1c. We're going to graph negative 3x squared. In your mind, you already know what it's going to look like. Yeah, you think back to the numbers that we just had, and you tell yourself, wait a minute, I'm just going to throw a negative in front of that. So instead of negative 2, positive 12, it'll be negative 2, negative 12, you know, since we just did this. But again, for a little while, you may need to make a little table. But this is our parent function. Ax squared is our parent function because it gives us the shape of the graph. And we are constantly comparing that to the original parent function of the entire class of quadratics, which is f of x equals x squared. But again, our hope is that you can visualize in your head exactly what's going to happen from what you know about a, h, and k. Especially in pre-calculus, it's, it's not necessarily about getting every teeny little point. It's about... Do you understand the behavior of the graph? Do you know what's going to happen with the graph? And use that knowledge to figure out whatever you need to answer about. Right now in pre-calculus, we're doing what's called analysis. And analysis means you're talking about the domain, the range, all of the important characteristics of a graph. And in the end, we probably have 12 things that we could talk about in a graph like this. It seems pretty basic, you know, but what we want to do is get all the important information. So this one had two pieces to its transformation. It did have a stretch, factor of 3. But how do we explain the fact that it went up? There you go. Not any different than our absolute value. Really new to us, you know, it's just not. Domain of this one. All reals? Nothing we can't put in there? But our range is different this time. There you go, y is less than or equal to zero. So you'll notice down here, we're talking about reflections f of x equals ax squared, we're going to see that a is negative. And that will give us a reflection over the x-axis. So when we see that, we should be thinking right away, oh, this one's going to go down. And then we check the numerical value. Is it a number that's bigger than 1? Well, it's going to be skinnier. And if it's a fraction between 0 and 1, well, then it's going to be a little wider. We just picture that. So this is, how does the value of a affect the graph of the parabola? It makes it go down. It opens downward. 
again, if we remember what we did about absolute value, I remember telling you we did absolute value. If we hit this age and pay stuff down now, that thing the rest of the year is going to be a cakewalk because it does the same thing, gives us those same transformations. And then it says, describe how the value of A affects the parabola's maximum or minimum value. Well, there's something new to think about. If it's opening up, does it have both a maximum and a minimum? Which one does it have? It has a minimum. It has a bottom. So this would have a minimum. But no maximum. Our arrows are telling us that's going to go forever in the upward direction. But look how that changes now. Same thing with our absolute value graphs. Same thing. That's another piece in pre-calculus of the analysis that we do. You know, and again, we don't necessarily graph it. We think about what the numbers tell us. Domain, range, maximum, minimum, sometimes local maximums and local minimums. And we just keep going with what we know about the graph based on the numbers. Graphing translations of f of x equals x squared is problem two. And this one says g of x equals x squared plus 3. So with this one, my parent function, and I maybe don't always write it down, but I'm constantly thinking about our normal parent for parabolas. It's not really normal, but just think about those in the so we have to write those down. So we see that graph over here. That's f of x equals x squared. But I don't want to make a whole other table to add 3 because I'm supposed to know what that 3 is doing. Is that an h or is that a k? It is a k. There's no parentheses. Remember, to be attached to the x and switch this right or left, it has to be in parentheses and attached to that x. So that 3, that k value of 3, what's that going to do to the graph? It's counting. All we're going to do is pick some points here and move them up 3. <coughs> Pardon me. tables if I don't have to. If I know what A, H, and K are going to do. I don't want to make a table. I just want to move this stuff. So what this did, our description here, would be translated three units up. Now on the test, you know, you could always write shift three units up. But I talked about this before, whenever you're taking a college and schools class or an AP class of some kind, the big fancy geometry words, they, they get you, well, brownie points, basically. If people are reading your, your information, they're like, wow, they remembered all of that vocab from way back when. Well, they're doing a great job. Domain. We have any numbers that we can't square and add 3 to. Still all reals. But we notice we're not starting. You got it, Justin. New starting place. Well, now we're at three. We knew that was going to happen. And we shifted this whole graph up three. So, there's one for you. And I would say this is probably the harder of the two translations. And that's because we have to remember something. Hopefully you're remembering it right now as you take a peek at that. But I'm going to go ahead and stop the recorder and I'm going to get you a piece of candy. And, and I want you to talk through this with your partner. Everybody ready to talk about this one? No? All right, we have g of x equals the quantity x plus 4 squared. Maddie, what did you do with this one? How did you get it to a new spot? Left four. Excellent. And I saw that everybody remembered that, or almost everybody remembered that as I was walking around. 
uh, because we have to remember whatever is attached to that X is always the opposite of what we see. So my description of the transformation here is translate four units left. So Lexi, did you make a brand new table for this? No, I just took each point and made it up. Exactly. Good job. That's what we wanted to do. Use our past knowledge and just move on. Make it about counting. I mean, how often are you going to make a mistake counting, right? Don't make a new table. Think about what you know. So we need to talk about the domain and range of this one and whether or not anything new has happened here. So Jack Ferry, what would you put for domain? All the numbers. So you couldn't find any numbers that wouldn't work in this little bugger, huh? Oh, they're all good. They're all good. Devin, what did you put for the range on this one? Okay, we're still, this is at zero, zero. Well, this is at zero, actually negative four, zero, but the y is still at zero. So y is greater than or equal to zero. So, question I want you to talk with your partner about right now. Of A, H, and K, which of those letters affect the range? Of A, H, and K, which of those letters affect the range? Go ahead and talk to your partner. <laughs> so I heard lots of K. Is that the only one that affects the range? What else? A. If A is negative, instead of greater than or equal to, we'd have to go less than or equal to. So it's A and K that we have to watch for when we're talking about the range. All right. Now, vertex form, this is the one we like. We've got this nice A, H, and K. And I hope you're thinking ahead to, boy, if these are in standard form, I hope we find out a way to change them into vertex form so that I can graph this really easily. And we do, and it's a process called completing the square. And we're going to talk about that process, um, in fact, in this chapter. So vertex form, here's what we know. We know that the vertex is always going to be at H and K. It's going to be our new starting point, just like it was for our absolute value graphs. Our axis of symmetry is always going to be with the ones that we're talking about. It is possible to have right and left opening parabolas, but the ones that we're going to work with are just up and down. So that axis of symmetry is always going to karate chop the x-axis. And then you realize, wait a minute though, if it's going to be the x-axis, that means that it's the x-coordinate that matters for the axis of symmetry, and that's the case. So x equal to h is what we focus on when we're talking about that new axis of symmetry. And then what does a have to do with it? Well, we've been talking about that. If a is greater than zero, not greater than zero, greater than, looks a little weird there, means it's positive, and that means it's going to open up. And if A is less than zero, then it's going to open down. Why didn't I put anything there about if A is zero? Talk to your partner. What happens if A is zero? Do you get an X squared if A is zero? Because you'll have zero x squared, it'll be gone. So you'll just get a line. You know that that's all you'll get. And we're not talking lines, so we're not going to talk about a being zero. We're talking about if it's positive or it's negative. And then the minimum or maximum value it always occurs at the vertex, but it's a matter of whether or not it's opening up or opening down. So really, I would just use a little sketch for this and say, you know what? That's going to be my minimum right there. Now that's that's the bottom. But if A is negative, then I'll have a max, a maximum value up there. So it all depends on that A value, which again, A has a lot to do with the range as well. So vertex form makes things go very, very quickly. <coughs> this says 
for y equals 3, absolute value of x minus 4 squared minus 2, what are the vertex, the axis of symmetry, the maximum or minimum value, the domain and the range, and then sketch this parabola. So here's what we want to do. We want to graph this as our new parent function because A always tells us the shape of the graph. And then we're just going to use H and K to move it. That's all we're going to do. So, in fact, I think we did that. Didn't we have 3x squared as one of our other tables that we did? Okay, so with your partner, go ahead and draw the sketch of the parent function. Remember, it's a helper, so it has to be dashed. And then move it H and K and talk about all this great stuff in here. Once you've found your vertex, you've really found where you need to move it. So we would have our y equals a, x minus h squared plus k. The thing that's always missed the most with these is the h value. And I just have to constantly be thinking opposite of what I see. Negative 4 is actually 4 to the right. So once we have that sketch of the paired function, all we need to do is move that 4 to the right and 2 down, and that's a matter of counting. And you go back and you find those nice points, nice grid points that you used before, and you just move those. And then, sometimes it's a good idea to go ahead and put in that helper line of your axis of symmetry so that you can see, hey, I need equal but opposite on the other side. That sometimes goes a little faster than counting all of your points. And it's helpful to get you to remember what the equation for the axis of symmetry is because you realize, hey, that's going to be x equals, and it's going to be x equals 4 at this point. So notice everything helper is going to be dashed or dotted. Does this one have a max or a min? Min? And what is that min? Okay, now here's what, here's what I need to let you know. There are two teachers in the department that always have their students write maximum and minimum the same way, and they take off points if you don't write it that way. So one of the things I want to do in case you have a new teacher next semester, <coughs> which is quite possible because there's three of us, I want to teach you how they like to have this written. So they're going to have you write minimum of negative 2 at x equals 4. So they're saying, let's have everybody understand that the minimum is the lowest that this will go. And the lowest it's going to go is negative 2. And where does that happen? It happens at x equals 4. Domain of this. All reals? Range. Good. Y is greater than or equal to negative 2. So vertex form, we really like it. It's got that whole A, H, and K business going on. Makes life a lot easier. So this one is for you and your partner. I don't know why the doors are banging again already. But notice with this one, we're not graphing it. You know what I do, though? I make a little sketch in my head. Get it all together. Um, Allie, what'd you put for the vertex? Excellent. You didn't want that H value trick you there. Riley, axis of symmetry. Good. You didn't forget to put the X equals, because that, that's another thing people always forget on the test. They slap down negative one, but they forget that part. Maximum or minimum, I need to know which one it has and then what it is. So let's see. What's the middle here? Bryce. Maximum of 4x. Maximum. That doesn't look like maximum. Maximum of 4. At x equals negative 1. Good, good, good. Um, domain. All reals. And range. Ashley Lynch, what you got? Mm -hmm. 
So again, when I see a problem like this, I see, ooh, negative 2. There's a squared, so that's going to be a parabola. It's going to go down. And then I think, where is that point right there? And that's always the vertex, so that's going to be that negative 1, 4. And that really helps you think about that range as well, because you know, hey, it's got to go down. So y is less than or equal to 4. Wow, fantastic job. Things you guys did really, really great on that first lesson. You know what? This is a really good place for us to stop for today. We've already talked about a lot of parabolas here. That's a good place to stop. So, so obviously, when you know what you're doing, you're going to go pretty doggone fast. So, I didn't think you needed a ton of these. I never like that the assignment tends to look really long because I, I skip and just give you a few of these, a few of these, and a few of these. But it's a lot better than saying do one through eight to you know. So, um, and as it says, list the domain and range for all of them because they don't give you enough practice at that. And then for 20, 25, and 27, describe the transformation you know, before you do it. Right now, I think this is going to go tens of two to the right and three down. Those type of things. But don't forget about A as well. And always think order of operations when you're describing that transformation. So you start inside the parentheses, go out to the A value in the front, and then talk about the up and down. Lots of graph paper. I have the copy the album and a whole bunch of that for us in there too. That will make it go really fast. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you.